All right, everyone, let's begin. I apologize for the delay. Uh, we're back in our study in the Odyssey. Thank you. Um, back in our study of the Odyssey, this is just a little map behind me, a little sense of orientation of the uh, episodes dealing with what gives the book its name, namely Odysseus's Odyssey, the wanderings that he takes place. And those are recounted in the first 12 books of the Odyssey. They're actually the wanderings are depicted there. He, uh, in, the, in the first four books of the Odyssey, we're back in Ithaca where he's from, Ithaca being located right over here on the west coast of Greece. Oh, you can't even see my pointer, but it's 16. I wish I had a different color, but you can see it moving there. Uh, so it's a little city-state on the west coast of Greece, Athens being on the other side. Uh, that's where Odysseus has his home. He's the king of Ithaca. Uh, and that's where the, account, the encounter begins in Ithaca. We're with Telemachus and Penelope and the suitors. And we left off last time uh, looking at some of the features of the epic in general and left off with uh, the Zeus recounting to the other gods the terrible tragedy that ensued when Agamemnon came home to find his wife with not a group of suitors but with one suitor and they conspired to murder him. And uh, his son tried to make the best of the situation and he took justice on them by killing both his uh, mother's suitor and his mother for that matter. But killing your mother is not a good thing in the Greek world either, so all sorts of tragedy ensues there. It doesn't get into that. What it does do is put in the backdrop the possibility that, that our hero Odysseus is going to face a similar fate when he returns home. So it sets the stage as it were. It's dramatic foreshadowing, it might be called in other contexts. So a story is told and the story is significant to the main story, which is the story of Odysseus coming home. But we're not yet there. The first four books of the Odyssey are uh, on Ithaca and the hero is not present uh, at this stage. He's being mentioned by other people, but we have yet to see him as this, uh, the prime focus of the action, for which reason the first four books are, are often by critics called the Telemachy just to describe that f stage in the book. And as I say, those uh, Telemachus is the main focus of action there, which is an odd way for a story to begin. In general, when you have a story uh, named the Odyssey, thereby, thereby about Odysseus, you expect Odysseus to at least appear in the action in the, at the beginning of the book, and yet he's not there. He's away from there, and what we see is the consequence of the absence of the hero on his family and on his kingdom. Now, uh, one of the grand themes of Homer's Odyssey is, on, is the theme of justice and its association with wisdom. I gave a little backdrop last time that talked about how the whole Trojan War began, this quarrel between goddesses over a golden apple which led to um, Juno's ire and to Athena's ire because the goddess that won the, uh, the uh, esteem that she was the fairest of them all and offered uh, delights to uh, the young man who chose her uh, was named Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And he gave, she gave him uh, Helen and started the whole war off. But the injustice here was seen in a variety of events and injustices sometimes caused by the gods are none, nonetheless against the character of the gods and the gods won't tolerate the injustice existing in ad, ad infinitum. Now if you see a contradiction in this, the gods themselves being involved in repeated injustices and yet being concerned with injustice, you're not the only one. Uh, this is a, critic, a, a critique of Homer made by the philosophers of his day. They say you portray the gods, the immortals, as unjust, and yet you 
claim to uphold justice. How is this possible? You're not very consistent in this. And we'll see Plato, in the end, decides to throw the poets out of his republic entirely because they don't know what they're talking about. I'll deal with that in a couple weeks. For now, uh, we have injustice being demonstrated in the kingdom of Ithia, Ithaca. Let me just say a little bit about that. Uh, remember, Odysseus and all of the other Greek princes have gone to war in Troy to punish the injustice done by at the, at the hands of one of the Trojans uh, upon uh, Agamemnon's brother uh, when his wife was taken away. This is a grave injustice. You don't take away a, another man's wife, let alone take her back to your kingdom as a prize. We have to punish you for that. So it's an injustice. But in the absence of these heroes, and it's been 20 years now, the kingdom of Ithaca itself is suffering the consequence of injustice. What do I mean by that? Well, in every kingdom in this day, the king is also the chief justice. He is the one who, uh, for whom the, to whom the, the sword is given for the purposes of administrating justice. And since Odysseus is away, all of the lawless individuals in his kingdom are basically running roughshod over justice. And when we meet uh, Penelope and uh, Telemachus in Ithaca, we find that there are various young men who just sit in Penelope's and Odysseus's ho a house and are eating them out of house and home. They're, get, they're being given hospital hospitality as would befit anybody in the ancient world, but they are long outstaying their welcome. And not only are they eating him out, like if you stay as a guest in somebody's house for 20 years, you're no longer a guest. Right? You're no, even if it's not ten, 20 years, but a number of years, you're no longer a guest. You're basically an occupier. You're occupying this man's house, eating his goods, and they're sleeping with his maidservants furthermore. So there's all sorts of injustice being built up here, but there's nobody to punish injustice. And so though Odysseus has gone to the kingdom of Troy over here at number one and corrected that injustice, he's left his own home subject to unjust forces and to the, to the rule of Poseidon, really, the earth shaker. And so he cannot be seen to be a great hero because although he's fixed other people's problems, he hasn't solved his own family's problems. His, own, his son's grown up without a father. His kingdom has no king. His wife is being subjected to the advances of all sorts of young men, and they can't do anything about it. It's, it's unjust. What sort of hero would allow this to happen? And the answer is none. So, even, so he cannot be the man which we said last time he was famed for being. He is a hero. He's a role model. You can't be a role model if you're a hero in your public life, but at home you've wrecked your family or left it open to the ravages of others. And so we meet the uh, sort of, we get a, a portrait of the scene of devastation back in Ithaca where Penelope and her young son, who's now 20, he's, he looks like Odysseus, he's a, big, he's a big man, but he doesn't know how to act. He doesn't know what to do. And so what we get here is a depiction of the importance of fathers, among other things, and the importance of role models and the importance of mentors. And as I said to you, uh, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, even disguises herself as an old man named Mentor. This is where we get the word from. I, I think I asked you last time where the word mentor appeared in the Bible. It's all around in Christian circles. You hear about mentoring all the time. It's actually not in scripture. But the idea of, a, of an elderly man, a wise man giving counsel to the young and being a role model. Remember I said paideia wasn't just uh, an intellectual knowledge, but teaching you how to behave. You do that by example. And there is no example for this young man. And so he doesn't know how to act. Uh, it probably sounds familiar. A lot of young people these days grow up with uh, moral examples to teach them how to act. And so what happens? They are prone to rage. They're prone to drug and alcohol abuse. They're prone to uh, anxiety, depression, all sorts of things. Because they don't know how to act, they feel they ought to do better, they criticize themselves, they feel badly about themselves, and they end up a bit like Telemachus. 
he keeps hearing his father's a great man and he looks like his father even but he doesn't act like his father and he uh, is paralyzed by the guilt so it's a study in some ways in human psychology it's really interesting in that sense and it's also the the effect of war on a family so here's a war hero gone away from home now let's look at his family and it, so it's it actually is looking at domestic life in a way and, and seeing what happens, the terrible consequences of war even on a family, which you rarely see in accounts, like if the, if the Iliad is about a war, you would expect this to be again a, an unblemished praise of the life of war. And it's not gonna study the domestic consequences, but it does because they're real. And this is why this, this Odyssey is being seen to be such a profound text, is it is, is actually looking at all sides. It's, it's doing a, a look around. And so he, he begins here, our friend Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, 20 years old, uh, underneath his mother's skirts, as it were, not having left the house and not knowing what to do. Not happy about the suitors who are vying for his mother's hand. But you know what? He's one and they are many. And what is he going to do? He doesn't know what to do. Uh, Athena, who is the goddess that looks after Odysseus, is also concerned with Odysseus's household. And so she's not only going to bring Odysseus home, she's going to make sure that his home is ready to greet him. And that means she has to get his wife and son prepared for him to come back. That's where she begins. So very interesting study in how f that family dynamics work together as well. It's not enough for the, the husband to be out doing great things on the battlefield while at home things go to seed. Not, not good enough. And so Homer is teaching his audience about the importance of integrity everywhere. You know, you can be out getting as much money as you want, but if your family goes into ruin, your life is in ruin. And and uh, Athena, who uh, wants the fame of Odysseus to be what he, she believes he deserves it ought to be, needs to look after his house first. So she goes in the guise of an old man by the name of Mentor and starts teaching him what to do. And the first thing she does is uh, tells him to stand up for himself. And so he speaks up in the assembly. He takes the scepter which they've never seen him do. The scepter is what you raise when it's your turn to speak in the assembly there among the Greeks. They don't all just shout over one another, I've got the scepter, there's one, one person speaking here. And he rebukes them and they're shocked because they've never heard him speak. And his mother's shocked because she's thinking that was a very mature manly thing to do. Where on earth did that come from? And he even tells her off. Uh, but that's not where Mentor concludes. He concludes by telling uh, Telemachus, who's depressed, that he ought to go look, at, look to see if he can find his father. He's not even sure that he's alive. In fact, he doesn't think he's alive. And, and this too is realistic because um, in situations where there's uncertainty, it's hard to hold on to a hope for fear that your hopes might be dashed. So you don't want to believe that he's alive because if, if he's alive and you're holding on to the hope that he might just be alive and then you find out that he's dead, you're gonna be devastated by your folly in believing 20 years after the fact that he, he's alive when everyone else says he's dead. And he's, let me just move on from this. I, I don't wanna believe that my father's alive and we'll find his wife Penelope's the same way, except there's a little bit more complexity with her. She is believing that he is alive. At least that's what she's saying to the suitors because she doesn't know any different, firstly. Secondly, she's loyal to her husband. Thirdly, these men can't hold a candle to her husband. So why would she marry one of these fools? But fourthly, um, she has a certain role within her family of holding on to the integrity of Odysseus's household and she's proud to be her, his wife. And so she's saying he might not yet be dead, but he, she pawns off the suitors a bit who are trying to get her to marry one of them. And the reason they want to marry her, they could just take her by force, uh, easy enough. 
They want her to marry them because then they get the whole estate. Then they get to be the king of, Ith of Ithaca and they get all the wealth and everything else. Now, if they just take, uh, take Penelope just the way uh, Helen had been taken, then other people are going to come in and say, you've just taken another man's wife. This is wrong. And they won't be secure. They want to do it legitimately so that they can then rule in his place. They may not even care about her, but they want his uh, wealth. And so again, very accurate portrait of human motivations, very complicated in some ways. We're told she's beautiful, but I think they're more, they, these are bad men. They're not interested in Penelope. They want what she has. She comes along with it. And then of course, when they're in place, what's Telemachus's state? Because he's the heir. What are they going to do to Telemachus? You got to get rid of him and she and mother knows it. If I marry him, he's now legitimate. That means my son is effectively illegitimate and he's a threat to the throne. Furthermore, so my son is dead. He's a, he's a dead man walking. So if I can't marry one of these guys, so she's thinking about her, her son as well. So she has a brave face. She puts the suitors off and this is an illustration of her wisdom by telling them that she has to weave a shroud for her father-in-law. Odysseus's father, who is not yet dead. This is a pious act for a woman to do, and they accept it, even though they don't care a jot about piety. They say, okay, I guess we'll, we'll do this. And so she weaves on her web or her loom, this shroud, which will, be, will go over the casket when he dies. And at night she unweaves it. And so she deceives them. Now you have to, be, you have, to have a lot of drink to buy this for very long. So the suitors are, are, are not only stupid, but they, they drink a lot because they, she's been doing this every day for a very long time. As soon as I'm finished this shroud, I will marry one of you. Okay, boy, she's not making much progress here. And eventually she gets caught. One of the, one of the maids, I think, uh, rats her out. And, uh, and now they say, okay, enough of this. Now you are going to marry one of one of us as soon as this happens. So now the time pressure is up. Her, her time has ended. She can't fool them any longer. But the connection of, of wisdom with deceit is strong in the Odyssey. You might have noticed that. And here's going to be a problem for uh, a Christian reading of this and even actually for um, Plato is there seems to be a diverge, divergence between truth telling and wisdom. In fact, wisdom seems to be being good at lying to people and tricking them. Which is the world's understanding of wisdom, by the way. Practice throughout the world. Just tell them lies. And if you deceive them, more power to you. You get what you want. That's they're very clever. Many cultures still operate this way. I, it, politically incorrect to say it, but but true. Um, the cultures that don't act like that are cultures that have been transformed by by Christianity, quite frankly, because in Christianity, Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, is also the wisdom of God. So there's no divergence there. You cannot be wise and be a liar. Christians are told to be truthful in their speech, right? There's a, there's a unity between truth and wisdom here. We don't see it in the Greeks. Being wise is tricking people to get what you want. That's, that's what wisdom is. And Athena, the goddess, is portrayed as a trickster. You probably noticed it. Deception, lying, fraud, these are seen as characteristics of wisdom. Not so in scripture, and I, I mentioned Jesus, but even if you looked at the, uh, the book of Proverbs, there are two figures there. There's lady wisdom and, and on the one hand, and then you have a, an adulterous woman who speaks falsehoods. And they're contrasted. And, and the psalmist or the writer of Proverbs urge, urges us to pursue wisdom. It's, it's Solomon writing to his son. Follow her, don't follow her. So the wise Solomon is saying, follow the one who speaks truth. Don't follow the adulterous, deceptive woman. That's the one you should stay clear of. So a, a sharp divulgence here. And I will submit to you that the reason that 
wisdom in uh, Western cultures is considered so is not because they're Western, but rather because of the influence of Christian doctrine, uh, biblical teaching. Right? You noticed it, right? The wisdom and the, and, and the fact that there's no even attempt to apologize for goddesses being deceitful or, or the hero being deceitful or for anyone for that matter. It's just the way you do it. In fact, Athena counsels Odysseus, basically never tell the truth. Don't reveal the truth to anyone, even your wife. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell a soul. That will show you that you are the wise man. Remember, they're the role model. Odysseus is the role model for the whole culture. Be a liar. Is anyone shocked by that? Is it culturally insensitive? I don't know. There aren't any ancient Greeks around, so I think I can get away without offending any ancient Greeks. That, but it's, it's there in the Odyssey. Tell me it's not so. Yes, sir. So before the part uh, in the Gospel where Jesus says not to tell anybody about him, like basically not say that he's the Messiah. Yes, that's denying, that's refraining from revealing who he is, but that's not the same as saying, well, tell him that I'm just somebody else, right? So not revealing something is not the same thing as explicitly deceiving. In fact, he regularly rebukes people for who say the wrong thing about him. He could just say, okay, you know, he corrects them when they speak falsely of him. That's not the same thing as having to offer up. So again, this is a bit of wisdom then, is in context, when do you put all your cards on the table? In what context and when did Jesus do it? Now, these are things that actually require a great deal of discernment in reading. What I'm trying to portray here is that there is no overlap between truth telling and wisdom at all in the Odyssey. It's just not there. For which reason, the philosophers led by Socrates and, and others of his day are going to sharply critique Homer for lying about the nature of the gods. Because the gods can't be the way you say they are. Right? And, you, and we, we have sympathy with Plato. We, we'll come to that in a couple of weeks. Yes? So the companionship of the truth and wisdom, then makes when Odysseus tells the truth to the Cyclops. Foolish. Absolutely. The, 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 you know why he didn't come home? Because the Muppet told the truth. He revealed who he was. He said, I'm Odysseus, sacker of cities. You want to know who I am? I wouldn't tell you who I am. Now that I'm far enough away from you and I've blinded you, stuck you in the eye, where we'll come to that in a, a few minutes, I'm going to tell you who I am. Why does he tell him? Because he wants to st stick it in his eye, literally. I've already blinded you. Now I'm going to gall you by telling you who I am. I'm Odysseus, sacker of cities. You tell people, if you want to know who, who, what my name is, here's my name. And the consequence of that is that um, Polyphemus, the Cyclops, calls out to his father, who is Poseidon. And Poseidon says, okay, now I know who you are. I'm going to make sure you never get back home. So the, the only time he tells the truth, he, he impedes his voyage back home. Is, this is a, a direct teaching about the importance of not telling the truth. It's not only you should always lie, but you should make sure not to tell the truth. I mean, how twisted is that? It's not a comment on, on the Greeks, by the way, Greek people. It is a comment on the culture and the uh, understanding of the Greeks in the ancient world before Christ. And, and it, what it then illustrates is how much the culture is transformed by Christ. If, if Greeks don't act that way, it's not because of their own culture, it's because of the influx of Christianity. Paul's uh, voyages are going through Asia Minor and into Greece, Corinth, Athens, right? Yes, and then I'm going to move on. Telemachus. Telemachus is asking or going to ask somebody about his father or something, or Odysseus is going to ask somebody about something. And Athena says to him, or to one of them, that they won't lie to you because they are thoughtful. 
Right. Thoughtful mean there? Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. That's a very good question. Why won't, what does that exactly mean? What does thoughtful mean there? Maybe beneath all of the lies, there is some importance to truth. I think that's what meant, is meant by thoughtful there. They won't lie to you because that, another reason you could give, but it's not the one that she gives there, is because it doesn't cost them anything if they tell you the truth because you've got, there's no advantage to them. They can tell you the truth and it doesn't matter. Either you're in no position to do anything. Except the whole teaching of the Odyssey is actually in those situations when you think you're going to get away with it and you may as well tell, like Odysseus stabs Polyphemus and he's rowed away in his ship and he's thinking, this guy can't hurt me anymore. I'm going to tell you it came back to bite him a lot. Like he's, he has been prevented from getting home for that reason. So I don't think there's any situation there, except that interestingly, and it's just a hint, when she says that he's thoughtful, it may hint that there, that there is some value to the truth, but the dominant, still my, my case remains the same, that the dominant um, takeaway lesson here is that to be wise is to not, is, is to deliberately deceive. Yes? Yes. So as far as what I've known about Greek and like the wise people of Greek mythology is that they could evaluate whether or not if I lie here or if I tell the truth here, what do I gain? Like you said, they had nothing to gain with uh, lying or telling the truth. So that's why they told the truth. That's a bit of that, but so a judgment, they're judging their own self-interest in, so it's like the politicians, what do you want me to say? Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll tell you that. And, and in, in, in Greece, it was so strong that the sophists, if you're doing Greek philosophy right now in your ancient, are you doing ancient philosophy right now, philosophy class? I don't know. Plato and the sophists, that's the debate. The sophists sell their teaching for a lot of money and they, they're renowned for their wisdom. And what's their wisdom consist in? Well, persuading other people to give them their money. It's a real skill. It's called marketing. But, but here there's no connection between what you say to people and the actual product here. It's just, can I persuade you to give me your money? I can give you great speeches. Again, Plato comes along or Socrates and will question these uh, teachers of wisdom whether they actually are as wise as they appear and why Socrates is upheld as such a great figure is because he sees truth and wisdom are united which begs the question of where on earth he got this idea from since the Greeks learned all of their wisdom from Homer. Their tradition is not there. And some have suggested that, uh, and this is one of the opinions of the church fathers, that Plato went on a voyage to uh, Egypt. We know that he did in early days and there he encountered um, the Old Testament teaching of Moses and something about the one God that delivered them from the land of slavery and so forth and brought back the idea that there's only one God and that he represented justice and truth and wisdom and so forth. And that, and he brought that back and it transformed Greek philosophy. I think it's a bit speculative. Maybe they have a source and maybe it's not just speculative. I think it's at least plausible because this is so different, right? Anyway, I'm off track here. Uh, book one's to four, one to four, the Telemachy, I'm gonna skip over it just because I'm already behind. And I want to move on to book five to meet for the first time Odysseus. And we find Odysseus with none other than Calypso. Um, so we've heard about Odysseus back at the end of book four, but um, I'm going to pick him up in book five. So it's page 88 if you're using this edition here. And now we meet Odysseus for the first time. And we've already heard about, remember when we invoked the, at the invocation of the muse, we, t we were told that he was saddened, that he couldn't get home. Now we're going to see this e expanded upon. So the, the uh, setting has transformed a little bit uh, to the land of, where is she? Uh, am I even going to find it? I'm not sure I am. 
it's in the uh, it's in the navel of the world. It said right in the middle, and nobody knows where it is exactly. But oh, by the way, let me just say something about this. Odysseus, we're told, is with a figure by the name of Calypso. Aside from its tenuous associations with the type of dance that I know nothing about, but some you know, Calypso. It is, it's a Greek word that we use in various uh, English words, like a eucalyptus tree, and also the word apocalypse in uh, the last book in the Bible, the book of, of Revelation or of St. John of the Apocalypse. Uh, it's there as well, the calypsus there. In those instances, uh, calypso or the verb calypso is to provide shade. A eucalyptus tree is so leafy that the sun doesn't break through it, so it's, it's, it provides good shade. An apocalypse, on the other hand, is something that was in shadow and you couldn't see it and suddenly it's pulled out into the light. It was in the dark and now it's in the light. That's what an apocalypse is. It's not doom and gloom. It's something that was hidden and is now revealed. The problem for Odysseus is that he is in the embrace of Calypso and he is hidden from the world as a result. Nobody knows where he is. This is a man who's supposed to be famous. We don't even know if, he, if he's alive. Why? Because he's in the embrace of Calypso. And Calypso is going to give him a, a immortal life with her undying beauty. She is a, a goddess, so without peer among the mortals, even his wife. So she is beautiful, she is lascivious, she's a nymph, sex all the time. And she will live for eternity and she can give him eternity. Now the temptation for Odysseus is that every pleasure he will have eternally. Why would he not want this? If he goes back to his wife, his wife as beautiful as she was will have faded a little bit and she's going to die as he will. If he, can, if he stays with Calypso, he can live forever with a woman who is far more beautiful than his own wife and will always stay so. And when we meet him, we find him weeping on the beach because he can't get home. I, I said all that because you might think he's just homesick. I think there's a lot more to it than that. It's not just that he pines for his wife and his son. It's that he, there's something about himself which is lost in the midst of all this pleasure. And this is, the, this is the teaching of Homer here, is that the great Odysseus can be given every physical pleasure and be satisfied with them eternally, and yet he is no man if he is satisfied with that alone. This is no man. No man worthy of being called a man will be satisfied with that. More is needed. And what makes Odysseus a man is that he wants justice. And he wants the good to be done and what's right to be done. And it's not right for him to be sitting with this nymph while his wife is at home surrounded by men and his son is without a father and his kingdom has no justice. He's too good for that. And so what the Greeks are being taught, I've just said the negative thing about the Greeks, they're, you know, lying is open to them, but they are being taught that the noble Odysseus will not be satisfied with bodily satisfactions. He is more than that, and you should be more than that. So even though uh, Socrates is going to criticize Homer and the poets, he's still going to cite Homer and the poets precisely because he exalts a noble life. Here's a noble man who knows what nobility is, and he is not going to be um, satisfied with anything less than what is best. In fact, he's going to endure every hardship to go back home and the goddess of wisdom is going to tell him that that's part of the path of being wise is to suffer. The second teaching really interesting uh, with, with wisdom here. Lying, yes, but also suffering. Odysseus is famous for his suffering. Long suffering Odysseus he's called. It's even like an epithet. And, and scripture will corroborate this uh, in terms of uh, discipleship. Talked about sanctification that goes with it. There it's not because of suffering for the sake of suffering, it's because Christ endured suffering. 
and he uh, learned obedience through it, we're told in Hebrews. Extraordinary. He learned obedience through suffering. You would have thought the Son of God, who is God, is perfect already and does not, can't learn anything. But he does learn in a certain sense, not in the, not in the sense of uh, intellectual awareness, but the bodily experience of suffering has a lesson to teach if you're willing to endure it. Because suffering produ produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope is not put to shame, right? How that goes on? There's a chain of consequences. Something similar is taught, being taught here, the significance of suffering, even in the midst of adversity, but here it's for the sake of a, an ultimately good aim, and in Christian theology as well. But, but, and, and here it's closer to a Christian teaching, the importance of suffering. In terms of separating wisdom and truth, nothing like, no comparison. So in, when it comes to Christian theology, it will be for upholding the truth even when men curse you and beat you and deny and, and do everything to you, you're going to be doing so for the sake of the truth. There's the difference. Right? So I just wanted to trace that. But book five, we find him on the island of Calypso. And uh, Athena, again, speaking to the gods, bringing Odysseus to his attention again to Zeus. I'll just read this uh, section, uh, verse uh, six. Athena spoke to, uh, to them, the gods of the many cares of Odysseus, remembering, though he was in the nymph's house, she still thought of him. Father Zeus and all other blessed gods everlasting, no longer now let one who is a sceptered king be eager to be gentle and kind. Be one whose thought is schooled in justice. Note this. But let him always rather be harsh and act severely, seeing the way no one of the people he was lord over remembers God like Odysseus. And he was kind, like a father. But now he lies away on an island, suffering strong pains in the palace of the nymph Calypso, and she detains him by constraint, and he cannot make his way to his country, for he has not any ships by him nor any companions who can convey him back across the sea's wide ridges. And now there are those who are determined to murder his dear son on his way home. He went in quest of news of his father to Pelos, the sacrosanct, and to glorious Lacedaemon. So what is, she, what is Athena saying here? Why would any man act just in the future if this is his reward? The reward of a just man's life is to suffer terrible injustice, uh, injustice that's just heaping up. He can't get home. His son is being mocked and threatened with death, his kingdom subject to injustice. What's the reward of a just life if the gods, you're going to allow this and look on it and do nothing? Just like she did in the, right in the beginning of book one. And then in turn, Zeus, who gathers the cloud, made answer, and you might, this might line might sound familiar. My child, what sort of word has escaped your teeth's barrier? For is not this your own intention, as you have counseled it, how Odysseus shall make his way back and punish those others? Then bring Telemachus home skillfully, since you can do this, so that all without harm he can come back to his own country while the suitors in their ship come back with nothing accomplished. Okay. So she makes a rebuke and he responds to her in kind saying, why are you acting as if this wasn't your plan? Like you know, this, you engineered this so that he would appear inglorious, like uh, 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 nobody knows who he is and so that he will come out and be revealed at the last moment and then injustice will be punished for what it is and justice will be seen to be triumph. That's your doing, Athena. You wanted it this way. Why are you saying this? So we get something of the counsel uh, between her rebuking them for the apparent injustice and there's a secret plan beneath all this that wisdom, namely Athena, has in mind to bring the whole thing about at exactly as it is played out. Remember, these are two gods speaking. But then he goes on and he speaks to his beloved son Hermes. Hermes, the messenger of the god, often portrayed with wings on his heels, with a, a staff with serpents around it. He, he's the god of, of, of uh, messengers and ambassadors, but also of medicine. 
interesting combination of things. Um, Zeus calls upon Hermes to take the message to the nymph. Hermes, since for other things you also you are our messenger, announce to the nymph with the lovely hair our absolute purpose, the homecoming of enduring Odysseus, that he shall come back by the convoy, neither of the gods nor of mortal people, but he shall sail on a jointed raft and suffering hardships, note this is Athena's wish that this be so, on the 20th day make his landfall on fertile Scoria at the town of the Phaeacians who are near the gods in origin. And they will honor him in their hearts as a god and send him back by ship to the beloved land of his fathers, bestowing bronze and gold in abundance upon him and clothing, more than Odysseus could ever have taken away from Troy, even if he had escaped unharmed with his fair share of the plunder. For so it is fated that he shall see his people and come back to his house with the high roof and the land of his fathers. So the messenger of the God is going to convey this message. And note that Odysseus, who thus far has been, uh, when I said that the, that the characteristic of the heroes is that they have arete. Remember I said arete? Excellence. Part of their excellence is their physical attributes. They're strong, they're fast, they're good looking. Part of it is their character. They're wise, they're um, courageous. They command men with their voice and so forth. And part of it is their, their breeding. They're, these are kings and princes. Uh, you can only have so much arete if you're a slave. You can have some, by the way, but not much because of a station in life. To be excellent in all things, you have to have certain things that are just by birthright. And then finally, you will have wealth. You have to have fabulous wealth to have arete. It's the, it's the physical sign of your uh, ultimate worth. And at the moment, he has nothing. And the gods are going to make sure that he comes home with more riches than any of the heroes coming back from Troy. So he's going to be the, if you think about this Odysseus as the representation of a life pleasing to wisdom, wisdom is going to show that you're not just, to be wise is not to be some poor beggar that everyone calls a wise man. You're going to be seen to be better than everyone else. Like Solomon. Right? Solomon, who's renowned for his wisdom, but God adds wealth and kingdoms and so forth. But he sought first after wisdom. Same thing here, being taught. So he will go now. He goes and he speaks to uh, the goddess. She recognizes him as a god. And she speaks, if you, if you know, very courteously to him. She doesn't want to do what he has to say, by the way. But she's not so foolish as to oppo uh, oppose one of the Olympian gods. So she's going to try and do it in a wise way. I'll find different ways of getting around. Like, you've said this, and the gods want me to do this, but, and I'm going to find a way. I can't say no. That I can't do. But I can find a way of doing what you ask and yet undoing what I've said I'm going to do. That's, so that's what she wants to do. Uh, anyway, I'll just read her response. Line 93. Um, my heart is urgent to do what you want, if I can, and if it is a thing that can be accomplished, I'll do it. But come in with me so I can make entertainment before you. So the goddess spoke, and she set before him a table which she had filled with ambrosia, food of the gods, and mixed red nectar for him. The courier Hermes Argefontes ate and drank then, but when he had dined and satisfied his hunger with eating, then he, he began to speak, answering what she had asked him. You... A goddess, ask me, a god, why I came, and therefore I will tell you the whole truth of the tale. It is you who ask me. It was Zeus who told me to come here. I did not wish to. Who would willingly make the run across this endless salt water? And there's no city of men nearby, nor people who offer their choice hecatombs, prayers to the gods, and perform sacrifice. But there is no way for another god to elude the purpose of ages bearing Zeus or bring it to nothing. He says, you have with you the man who is wretched beyond all the other men of all those who fought around the city of Priam for nine years. And in the 10th, they sacked the city and set sail for home. But on the voyage home, they offended Athene, who let loose an evil tempest and tall waves against them. 
Then all the rest of his excellent companions perished. But the wind and the current carried him here, and here they drove him. Now Zeus tells you to send him on his way with all speed. It is not appointed for him to die here, away from his people. It is still his fate that he shall see his people and come back to his house with the high roof and to the land of his fathers. So he spoke. Note that it's his fate. I mentioned to you that fate, the fates are also goddesses, and they, 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 their will is above that of the Olympian gods. The Olympian gods are there to enforce what has been fated, and they cannot change it. That's why I say and many reasons why the Olympian gods are not like God is not only because there are many and he is one, it's because they have no ability to change anything. They're sort of trapped. They're, they're a lot like people, but they have superpowers and they're immortal. That's about it. They're bad people, pretty much. Yes? Uh, do the gods' lives like, have their own fate or are they kind of outside of the fate? Sort of outside of it because they don't die, right? So they're sort of, yeah, good point. The realm, the realm of man is subject to fate. Uh, the gods, I don't know if they're fated. We usually connect fate with life. So there are three fates and one of them pulls the strand of a person's life. The second measures how long it is and when it gets to that certain length then the third clips it. So it, the fates ru rule over the mortals. And the gods are immortal, so yeah, they're not subject to it in the same way. Okay? But they have no, so they, even though the gods are uh, higher than mortal men in every sense and powers and so forth, um, they can't change their lives um, in any significant way. That's not faded already. So it's a very limited power then. Yes? So that's another account, yes. So that's how Zeus got into his position. He overthrew his own father. Never mind that. That's how injustice got brought into the universe, by the way. I'll talk about that maybe when I look at um, Ovid's Metamorphoses, but it's the same account in Ovid as it is in the Greeks. There's a battle amongst the gods. And the battle that, uh, the one go battle we know about is between the giants and the Olympian gods and the giants are being thrown down into the underworld for this and punished there eternally. So the sky gods and the earthborn gods, but then there, there's a whole cosmic battle of war thing going on as well before that. And yes, Zeus killed his own father, bringing injustice. So ju Zeus representing justice is a contradiction in term. Just as a dis, uh, sorry, um, Oedipus who killed his father is a byword for an appalling act. In fact, Zeus complains that um, Agamemnon was slain. A father was killed. What a terrible injustice. Oh, you mean Zeus like you did with your father? That sort of injustice? Yeah, anyway. And you're really upset about it. Oh, really? You're that, that upset? Anyway, he's upset now because he is in the position. So yes, this is a terrible thing. This can never happen again. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Zeus calls him to, uh, calls Calypso to send Odysseus away. And how does she respond? Calypso, shining among divinities, shuddered and answered him in winged words and addressed him. You are hard-hearted, you gods, and jealous beyond all creatures beside. When you are resentful towards the goddesses for sleeping openly with such men as each, has made her true husband. So when dawn of the rosy fingers chose out Orion, all you gods who live at your ease were full of resentment until chase Artemis of the golden throne in Ortigia came with a visitation of painless arrows and killed him. And so it was. Also when Demeter of the lovely hair yielding to her desire lay down with Iasion and loved him in a thrice turned field, it was not long before this was made known to Zeus, who struck him down with a cast of the lightning thunderbolt. So now, you gods, you resent it in me that I keep beside me a man, the one I saved when he clung astride of the keelboard all alone, since Zeus with a cast of the shining thunderbolt had shattered his fast ship midway on the wine blue water. So it's Zeus is the, struck him his ship down, and yet you begrudge me for loving the man. 
You do whatever you know. You're hard. You're arbitrary. It's a, two rules, one for you, one for the rest of us. Again, the, the philosophers are going to hate this because it's true. No integrity at all. Uh, then all the rest of his excellent companions perished, but the wind and the current carried him here, and here they drove him. And I gave him my love and cherished him, and I had hopes also that I could make him immortal and all his days to be endless. But since there is no way for another god to elude the purpose of Aegis bearing Zeus or bring it to nothing, let him go. Let him go if he himself is asking for this and desires it. Now note that, the caveat, if he himself is asking for it and desires it. I'm, I'm not going to oppose you, but, it, but if he does, what do you want me to do? Okay, so now little if clause in there. If he is asking for it and desires it, out on the barren sea, but I will, not I, will, I will not give him conveyance, for I have not any ships by me nor any companions who can convey him back. Okay, so there's an if in there, and Argifonda says, okay, then send him on his way. Beware of the anger of Zeus. Okay, but she got the if clause in and he agreed to it. She, he didn't spot the if. So now what's she going to do? He's going to have to ask for it. And there, does he want to offend a goddess? This is going to have to, because she's agreed to do this. But, but if he agrees to this, okay, so now conversation goes on here. 160. She sees him looking for him. Well, no, actually, I'm not before 160. She sets out searching after great-hearted Odysseus, line 150. Found him sitting on the seashore, and his eyes were never wiped dry of tears. And the sweet lifetime was draining out of him as he wept for a way home, since the nymph was no longer pleasing to him. It's not because she wasn't beautiful. It's that she didn't offer him what he needed as a man which was a thing that she could not give, right? Note, note how it's, it's subtle here. It's not that he totally had no uh, desire at all. It's that there was something in a recognition in this. It's not that there are no there's no pleasure there, but ultimately there was no lasting, enduring pleasure. Again, he represents our role model here. Yes. Well, he does, first of all, yes. Yeah, no, he's not faithful to his wife, in case you're wondering. Uh, he had to do it. What, you don't believe that? <laughs> Probably true in some sense, but people have trouble believing this. I pass no comment. Um, if the gods are as they are portrayed to be, and they have the capacity basically to inflict limitless suffering or limitless, what, what do you do in that situation? It is out of necessity, I would say. But again, if you want to see these all as anthropomorphisms and one rule for the girls and one girl for the guys, and Penelope's back home and she's being faithful and she's not out of necessity going along with it, whereas he is, Again, the comparison is not just because these are men and this is a nymph, she's a goddess. So there are differences there anyway. But I, I know this always raises an eyebrow at the very least. <laughs> out of necessity. Yeah, oh, by nights he would lie beside her. Out of necessity, yes. <laughs> In the hollow caverns against his will by one who was willing. But all the days he would sit upon the rocks at the seaside, breaking his heart in tears and lamentation and sorrow. I don't see any reason in the text for us to doubt the sincerity of what Homer is saying there. There's, not, there's nothing in it, um, I think, because Homer is portraying a character here. He does this, but that's not where his heart is. He feels re uh, repulsed by it, and it's destroying him from the inside. She, bright among divinities, stood near and spoke to him. Now, don't believe a word she's saying here, but poor man, no longer mourn here beside me, nor let your lifetime fade away, since now I will send you on with a good will. So come, cut long timbers with the brawn axe and join them to make a wide raft, and fashion decks that will be on the upper side to carry you over the misty face of the water. Then I will stow aboard 
her bread and water and ruddy wine, strength giving goods that will keep the hunger from you and put clothing on you and send a following stern wind after so that all without harm you can come back to your own country. If only the gods consent. It is they who hold wide heaven and they are more powerful than I to devise and accomplish. So, so, spoke, so she spoke to him. But long-suffering great Odysseus shuddered to hear. Why would he shudder to hear? This is exactly what he wants. Why would he shudder to hear this? Because he doesn't believe what he hears. So, two aspects of wisdom. One, never tell the truth. Second, never believe anyone when they tell you something. Is it that even though he's desperate um, to go, but because he had tried already, he lost hope? It's kind of and he thinks that she's tricking him. There's something going on here. She's not telling me the truth. There's some thing, like she sees, I, I'm not doing what she wants me to do. I'm sitting here crying on the beach every day. She wants me to love her. I'm not doing that. This is a way of getting me wrapped around her finger somehow. So he's shuddering, thinking, there, what is she plotting here? That's what he's thinking. So he shudders and spoke again in turn and addressed her. Now with that in mind, what does he say? Here is some other thing you devise, O goddess. It is not conveyance, that is to take me there. When, because she just said she wouldn't do that, by the way. He doesn't know that, but she, he knows that she's not going to participate in this. When you tell me to cross the sea's great open space on a raft, that is dangerous and hard. Not even balanced ships rejoicing in a wind from Zeus can cross over. I will not go aboard any raft without your goodwill, nor unless, goddess, you can bring yourself to swear me a great oath that this is not some painful trial you're planning against me. So he spoke, and Calypso, shining among divinities, smiled and stroked him with her hand and spoke to him and named him, you are so naughty, and you will have your own way in all things. See how you've spoken to me and reason with me. Earth be my witness in this, and the wide heaven above us, and the dripping water of the sticks beneath us. Which oath is the biggest and most formidable oath amongst the blessed immortals? To swear by the underworld is the greatest. And this is no other painful trial I am planning against you, but I am thinking and planning for you, just as I would do it for my own self, if such needs as yours were to come upon me. For the mind in me is reasonable, and I have no spirit of iron inside my heart. Rather, it is compassionate. He doesn't believe her, by the way. But he's still going to go along. He has no choice. He's going to go along with it, but he's going to distrust her. At any rate, um, she, he tests her and pushes back a few times, tries in different ways. What he cannot do because she can destroy him, is to let her be unhappy as she goes. She has to go happily. And so he flatters her and so forth. And when she makes a comparison, asks him if Penelope is as beautiful as she is, he's like, do not say the truth, <laughs> whatever you do, do, which is, I think Penelope is more beautiful. Do not, whatever you do, do not say that. Because even if you get back then, she will find a way to get after Penelope. You better lie here. Don't tell the truth. The truth is going to hurt. Anyway, she sends him on his way. I, I, I'm going to skip over this. Um, but as he gets off the island and it's just stitched together, the raft, Poseidon, in the middle here, the, sees Odysseus back out on the water and destroys the raft. And Athena manages to get him to the shore. I'm just going to, I'm skipping over a great deal of text here. Gets him to the shore and he, his, his uh, ship breaks up on the coral and he is thrown by the, the waves or the rocks and is thrown by the waves onto the beach. Clothes ripped off of him, like scratched, bleeding and exhausted, uh, basically face down in the dirt and left there overnight. And because of the cold in the evening, he would have died there. He covers himself over with leaves just to keep from dying of exposure. That's where we pick him up in book six, in the land of the Phaeacians, whom Zeus had spoken of at the beginning. The Phaeacians are demigods. They're related to the gods. This is a land that no longer exists because it's a land that 
Poseidon is going to insist uh, is removed from the realm of mortals because it, this is a conduit for uh, people to get around the will of the gods and they can't have it. But I'll, I'll skip over that. It's the land of the Phaiakians, and we find himself at the end of this. Um, he's so exhausted, and he wonders, should I stay on the beach or should I go into the woods? If I stay on the beach, I'm exposed to the elements. If I go into the woods, there's wild animals. Which is better? They're both bad. He lies on the beach, he covers himself up with leaves, and he sleeps there overnight. That seems the wise choice. There, he's always thinking. And uh, sleep falls upon him and piles leaves on him, line 487. And then we get an epic simile as when a man buries a burning log in a black ash heap in a remote place in the country where none live near as neighbors and saves the seed of fire having no other place to get a light from. So Odysseus buried himself in the leaves and Athena shed a sleep on his eyes so as most quickly to quit him by veiling his eyes from the exhaustion of his hard labors. So he sleeps there, and Athena is now preparing his path home. How does she do that? She goes ahead and prepares the people that he's about to meet, and th that who will receive him and so forth. The one who will receive him is uh, the princess of the city there. Her name is Nausicaa, uh, line 25. Nausicaa is a young woman who wants to get married. She's a woman in her late teens or something like that. It's daughter of the king, so she's a princess. Uh, what do princesses do during the day? I have no idea, but they wash clothing in the water is one of the things they do. And uh, if they're wealthy enough like Nausicaa, they ask for their father's horse and carriage to do that. And so she comes along, Daddy, will you give me the keys to the car? And he said, okay, well, don't come back too late, whatever. And so Nausicaa goes off with, with her friends uh, to wash the cars by the, by the river, and uh, Athena directs her there. And she directs her there because this is how Odysseus is going to get to the land of the Phaiakians. Now, here's a problem with this. We left Odysseus off in what state? Naked. He is a middle-aged man. looking pretty rough, I would have thought, uh, with no clothes. And here are young teenage girls in daddy's court. So there's the scene. You can imagine the scene. Now, when you meet a stranger in the ancient world, you, there are certain things that you do in response to show that you're civilized. If you're really civilized, you go and grab their knees. So you get, you're on your own knees and you grab the knees of the person who you are beseeching. Now, if Odysseus grabs the knees of a young girl, he being naked, what's she gonna think? Uh, not good things, right? So this is one of the things he's gonna weigh up in this scene. Anyway, it's, it's a humorous scene. There's a lot of humor in the Odyssey. You might not, you might not expect it, but it, there's, there's a fair bit there. Um, but Athena is gonna prepare her to go, and she does, and then she goes, and she will meet Odysseus. Where are we gonna, where are we gonna pick this up? Um, uh, and the girls are not only uh, doing their laundry, but they're playing with a ball. Typical. They're not doing the work. They're throwing a ball, and the ball gets caught in the water. And he hears the cry of the girls, and it wakes him up. And he wonders where on earth he is, because he has no idea where he is at this point. Odysseus, he's just, it's, a sh it's a shore. Doesn't know the nature of the people here. And Odysseus wakens when he hears them cry. Line 118. Noble Odysseus wakened and sat up and began pondering in his heart and spirit, Ah, me, what are the people whose land I have come to this time? And are they violent and savage and without justice or hospitable to strangers? Note that hospitality and justice are seen together as well. It's a very strong link throughout the known world, mentioned in scripture as well, showing hospitality. It's a sign of justice to the stranger. Um, or are they without justice or hospitable to dangerous strangers with a godly mind? See now how an outcry of young women echoes about me of nymphs who keep the sudden and sheer high mountain places and springs of the rivers and grass of the meadows. 
Or am I truly in the neighborhood of human people I can converse with? He's just left the nymphs. He doesn't want any more nymphs. Keep the nymphs away from me. Or are these humans? But come now, I myself shall see what I can discover. So speaking, great Odysseus came from under his thicket, and from the dense foliage with his heavy hand he broke off a leafy branch to cover his body and hide the male parts. And when in the confidence of his strength, like some hill-kept lion, who advances though he is rained on and blown by the wind, and both eyes kindle, he goes out after cattle or sheep. Now, he's being compared to a lion here. By the way, the similes used in Homer's Odyssey will be picked up by later's writer, later writers. We will find the exact same uh, epic simile used in Milton's Paradise Lost. That they get repeated. So they, it's not just the structure of the epic, but even some of the imagery is picked up later over and over and over. Anyway, he goes out and he is like a lion and, we're one, and his belly is urgent upon him to get inside of a close study and go for the sheep flocks. But he's go, coming acro across young women here. What, what is he thinking? Because there's a little bit of an ominous thing. Like sh when a lion comes upon the sheep, he's about to eat them. This is, an, this is a man who's coming upon defenseless young women in the wilderness. What's going on inside of his head? It's, we're not, the, like the, the, the tension there is strong. So Odysseus was ready to face young girls with well-ordered hair, naked though he was, for the need was on him. And yet he appeared terrifying to them, all crusted with dry spray. And they scattered one way and another down the jutting beaches. Only the daughter of Alcanuus stood fast, for Athene put courage into her heart and took the fear from her body. And she stood her ground and faced him. And now Odysseus debated whether to supplicate the well-favored girl by clasping her knees or stand off where he was and in words of blandishment, ask if she would show him the city and lend him clothing. Then in the division of his heart, this way seemed best to him to stand well off and supplicate in words of blandishment for fear that if he clasped her knees, the girl might be angry because she would misunderstand. Even though that would be the most hospitable thing to do, maybe I'll dispense a little bit with the hospitality here because, right? So, blandishly and full of craft, he began to address her. I am at your knees, O queen. Ah, smart man. I'm at your knees. I show you that I'm supposed to be on, um, but I'm not there. Okay, I am at your knees, O queen. But are you mortal or goddess? If indeed you are one of the gods who hold wide heaven, then I must find in you the nearest likeness to Artemis. He likens her to Artemis. Why is that Artemis? Because she's a virgin. She's to uphold chastity. He, he's not suggesting anything untoward about her. He's not comparing her to Aphrodite lest she get the wrong impression here, to Artemis, the daughter of great Zeus for beauty, figure, and stature. But if you are among those mortals who live in this country, three times blessed are your father and the lady your mother, and three times blessed your brothers too. And I know their spirits are warm forever with happiness at the thought of you, seeing such a slip of beauty taking her place in the chorus of dancers. But blessed at the heart, even beyond these others, is that one who, after loading you down with gifts, leads you as his bride home. I have never with these eyes seen anything like you, neither man nor woman. Wonder takes me as I look on you. Yet in Delos, once I saw such a thing by Apollo's altar, I saw the stalk of a young palm shooting up. I had gone there once and with the following of a great many people on that journey, which was to mean hard suffering for me. And as I, when I looked upon that tree, my heart admired it long, since such a tree had never yet sprung from the earth. So now, lady, I admire you in wonder and am terribly afraid to clasp you by the knees. So he keeps going on about how he knows he should be on his knees, but why he isn't. It's out of reverence. He cites Artemis, the virgin. He cites a palm tree, normally not a form of flattery. You remind me of a tree. Okay, a tree? Yes, a tree. But the tree by, by the, that was favored by Apollo himself, right there. Uh, it's in love poetry in, in uh, Song of Songs as well. Women are compared to towers and trees and so forth. It's not a physical description. It's something of worth and value and reverence. 
right? It's the tree right by Apollo's own shrine. The hard sower was on me yesterday. On the 20th day, I'd escaped the wine blue sea until the current and the tearing winds had swept me along from the island Ogija, and my fate has landed me here. Here too, I must have evil to suffer. I do not think it will stop before then the gods have much to give me. Have then, have, then have pity, O queen, you are the first I've come to. So note all of this. So note, I said to you, this is a sort of an encyclopedia teaching the Greeks how to think about things. Here they're being taught how to act. Here's an older man with a young woman. How does he address her? He addresses her, her praising her beauty, but not in a lascivious way. Talking about her and comparing her with no, again, no comparisons to Aphrodite and you look hot, not that sort of thing. Nothing like that. You're like Artemis. You are a figure who your husband will rejoice to be with you. Your father must and your brothers and everyone who meets you. So she is, it's wholly admirable, nothing alarming whatsoever. Here's how men address younger women, right? Role model being given through the speech of Odysseus here. We will find this regularly in the, in the heroes that Homer admires. We're given examples. We're also given counter examples of bad people's speeches. And in all of that, we're being taught moral, a moral framework. How does one behave in a world where, uh, Greeks and civilized men are to be found. Note that they value hospitality above all things. It's an expectation. Because gods and goddesses sometimes disguise themselves as mortals, and you never know. You better. You better treat people with hospitality. But she thinks that he thinks that the gods will have uh, pain for him. So, at any rate, she takes him back to the city, and uh, in the end, uh, Athena thinks it better that he not be on the cart when he goes back to the city because what will the people think? Here's a man wearing someone else's clothing, not his. They'll recognize the clothing. It's probably the king's clothing or one of his brother's clothing. And the princess and nobody else, just the two of them in the cart coming back and he's wearing his, like what's going on there. That doesn't look very good. So again, she removes him from that scene, but he gets her back there. When he gets to the court, I think I'm going to run, I'm running out of time here. I have a couple minutes, uh, seven to 12. What we are going to find here is Odysseus recounting how he got where he is. I'm going to skip over most of it. I, next time, I'm going, to, I'm going to pick up two passages, the blinding of Polyphemus and the, uh, the account of the underworld. I, I can't skip over those two. But uh, in book 7 to 12, what Odysseus does is he tells us his own story of how he got to where he is. And the importance of storytelling is emphasized throughout this epic. Story is a way of creating a community, uh, of inculcating truth, of upholding heroic deeds and so forth, all of that. And Odysseus himself will tell the tale. And in the tale telling, we will find another interesting feature of storytelling, which is it seems to have a therapeutic effect on Odysseus to tell the story. It, it brings tears to his eyes to tell the story. And yet it also seems to heal him of some of the harms done by the storytelling. It unites him to his audience, but it also reveals him. He doesn't reveal in the sense he says, I'm Odysseus, but he's got tears over his face and he holds the veil up so they don't see it, but the king sees it. He knows he's, there's something, it's been exposed. He can't help it. The pain has revealed him. All the same, he hasn't given himself away and it's not considered to be like the Polyphemus episodes where it says, you know who I am? I'm Odysseus. N not so. He's been revealed through the tear and that seems to be okay. They, They'll give him a pass for that. You can't help uh, but, but show your suffering that way. But the, the, the Athena is in disguise. She will disguise Odysseus. She'll make him look big and strong. So she'll take away the years. She'll make him look like a young man. He competes in athletic games. He throws the spear, or is it the javelin, or is it the discus? I can't remember which discus. Throws it farther than the rest of them. Throws it into the next county, and everyone's like, Okay, the old man's got a little bit of life in him yet. Then all of, remember the, the Phaeacians are demigods and he throws it way beyond. So again, that's a little bit of a tell that this man is not just a man. There's something more about him here and he probably ought not to have shown off. 
right? He's, he should have restrained himself a little bit there. But I think we're done for today. Uh, please carry on, though. I will. I'm trying to catch up. Oh, yes, you wanted to remind me. And the reminder is, please tell me. I'll say it. Uh, 